feelings, and I, uh, let me start with the women here, about Kamala Harris. She's a woman of color. I'm not putting her down because of that, and I'm not putting her down because she's a woman. I'm not a feminist, so I'm sorry. But at the end of the day, I don't think that she has the personality. I don't think that she has what it takes to go up against Putin and go up against these other presidents that are built for this. I don't want to be scared because my president is scared. I want my president to feel secure and manly and about it. We brought up gender, right? Like, do you think yeah. it matters? that she's a woman and people aren't comfortable having a woman in a top leadership role? No, I don't no. think that because most men, they, they love their mothers. They love their wives. So yeah. mm -hmm. as a woman, most men, they respect the woman, but she just don't have the qualification or the education to really run America because she don't have the experience. She don't understand our struggles. Mm. And for me to believe you for another four years, you're crazy. Right. Like you're crazy. You're saying the same thing that you said four years ago. Again, so the fact that she's the vice president that's to just you the is bottom line. You're like, you've been here, you've had a chance. Yes. Well, for me, the very first time I ever heard the name Kamala Harris, it was an association to locking up parents for mm -hmm. a truancy. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I, I ever heard of her name. Mm -hmm. And I, I really didn't understand how this person claims to be a black woman, but yet she's locking up black women and black men and separating families. This is the thing that is, Trump talks about this a lot. He says, you know, Kamala Harris became black right. when it was mm -hmm. convenient. Right. Yeah. Can you can you talk to me about, do you feel, do you agree with him on that? Do you feel oh, like she's wearing Definitely. her blackness? Absolutely. She's sworn into the, when she's sworn to the Senate, it was as the first Indian American. Thank you. Which is, it's fine. We don't care. Yeah. We all know she's not black. Let's understand that. We we are all clear of that. But well, my point of view, well, like I, I told you earlier, she's already been there. She's right. in office. I've just got to say that one of the things that is so absolutely incredible is the fact that when you see MSNBC and the mainstream media and they go out into, you know, the urban populations, the rural populations, and they do these pieces, man, oh man, it doesn't matter from what background people come from, what their religion is, what their socioeconomic strata is, you know, uh, ethnicity, any of that, young, old, or whatever, these people know what they're talking about. I mean, the Amish were talking about the deep state, for God's sakes. They were talking about policies that they knew that were going on in the Biden-Harris administration. You saw these black women strongly articulate the position about Donald Trump. I mean, take a look at something here, folks. I just want you to go back and take a look. I think it's right here. Oh. Right here. This 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 is the look. Right here. Take a look at Alex Wagner. I mean, she doesn't know what to do. She's hearing these black women literally telling her why they cannot vote for Kamala Harris, that she doesn't have the experience, she doesn't have the education, she doesn't have the temperament. They want a person that's going to, you know, somebody that's a, a woman that's there, but who feels that they're going to be tough, like the lady said. I want it to be manly. Well, how much more manly can you get than Donald Trump? And then... And then she asked the question to them saying, what about that you hear this thing about questioning Kamala Harris's blackness? Now, when Donald Trump does that, he gets labeled as a bigot. He's prejudiced. He's a racist. How dare he bring that up? Well, what did you hear these women? I mean, here's a doctor. And she herself was saying that I first heard about Kamala Harris when? When she heard the stories who were going after black parents, especially single black mothers for truancy for their children and locking them up, either their mothers or their fathers for that. 
And we all heard about the girl who had sickle cell anemia was in the hospital so often and nearly destroyed her life as Kamala Harris. So she's going, she couldn't understand how could a black woman be doing this? I mean, you know, for truancy, you're locking, you're separating families and they say Trump and his administration, they were the ones that were separating children? I mean, it's just, and then she goes on to talk about, so you, she's talking about, well, guess what? When they heard about Kamala's blackness, that was the first time. The first time she ever mentioned it was when she won DA in California and she talked about being South Indian. There was no mention of being black, but when it was appropriate, when it was expedient, when she needed to move into the national level, all of a sudden, Kamala Harris, who has not a black gene in her body because her father is Jamaican, her mother is Indian, South Asian Indian, now for political expediency, she decides to be a black woman because guess what? There's very little power in being in a South Asian Indian woman. <laughs> you don't have any cachet. There's no bona fides for that. But you slip into the black vote, the black population, color yourself black. Oh, well, there you are. That's the way this is, and that's exactly what this group of women we're talking about. And if that's anything to come from, to pretend what's happening with the vote, folks, wow, wow, wow. It certainly looks like, you know, Trump has, he's not going to get the majority population. He doesn't need it. He just needs a few more percentage points to come his way with black women. He's doing it with black men. One out of four, one out of four under the age of 50 are doing it. So anyways, what I want to do right now is take you to what's happening in the poly market, show you what's happening on the real clear polling averages, and give you a sense of what's happening in the political sphere as far as early voting, early in-person voting, all of that. So stick around to the end of the video. Let's see what the poly markets have to talk about. And let's go. I think it's slide 17. We're going to go to that right now. So here's the poly markets, folks. As of October 23rd, here we've got Donald Trump at 61.4 and Kamala Harris at 38.3. And as you can see, when you go there, that's live. So I was just talking about 61.4. Trump went up just up to 61.5. So he ticked up point. Now he's down to 61.3. So it's fluctuating, obviously, in terms there. But as you can see here, Here's what sort of happened. This is back on July 19th when Trump was at 64 and a half, around 65, and Kamala Harris, not even in the picture, down at 19. But then post Biden, do the coup, post debate, and then all of a sudden, folks, you saw the explosion that occurred right here on October 4th. That's when they were literally tied, according to the poly market, the betting markets. October 4th. And then they've just exploded since then to where you see it right now. Let's just call it Trump 61, you know, Harris 39. So that's where we are in the betting markets. Now I want to take you to see what's happening, the real clear politics average, in terms of where I see the race at, in terms of the electoral college vote, I'll give you my analysis of what I think is happening there. And then we'll take you to what's happening in the political sphere. As I said before, all that early voting and early mail-in ballot and all that, you're gonna, it's going to absolutely knock your socks off, folks. Because if these trends continue, and that's if, 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 if these trends continue, it's going to be looking extremely, extremely well for Donald Trump on the day of election. So let's take a look at Real Clear Politics, slide number 17. So as you can see, 345 Trump, 193 Harris. This hasn't really changed much for me from the last couple of months and what I was talking about in electoral landslide even prior to this. But where I'm differing 
from a lot of the analysts, and I'm taking a leap of faith that right now I see that if the national polls have been basically saying that Donald Trump is plus two, plus three in the national vote totals, and in 2016 and 2020, he underperformed in the national polls and even some of the state polls, but anywhere from 4% to 8%. As I was looking at the cross tabs from a whole variety of pollsters, and I was looking at the ones that were in the top five, like Rasmussen, People's Pundit, um, Atlas Intel, Trafalgar, Insider Advantage, you know, taking a look at those. And now there's a couple of others that have come on the scene where Real Clear Politics was out there, On Point Politics with Lester, and I don't know who the person is with Gold Crown Politics. They've come out with some phenomenal uh, information and how they calculate um, you know, what they think is going to be the per- you know, percentage share, you know, down to the tenth of a point. They put their information out there. But then taking a look at the polls that are in the middle and then even at the polls that are at the very bottom, because you got to take a look at all of them. Look at the cross tabs, look how they're weighting them. Are they doing a 2020 recall vote? Are they basically the same with some of the polls where they're plus five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten Democrat? In fact, some of these polls, just like, for example, um, Rasmussen, I think they weight their polls plus two Democrat, but they're still called right-leaning polls. But they don't really have any skin in the game because they don't have the kind of multi-millions of dollars to continue to do those polls. They have to be funded individually and obviously by many other, you know, other companies and by grassroots campaigns. So if they're wrong, well, then who's going to listen to them the next time around? If the big polling companies are wrong, like they were in 16 and 20, nobody gives a shit because they still have enough money and they're going to still do the same damn thing. So getting back to my assumption, my political assumption, that based on all of that, Trump has been shown to underperform four to eight points. I said, if he's already, in my mind, at least, at least plus three nationally, and I don't think he ever dropped folks. I think he was, well, I think he might have dropped from when Biden uh, you know, dropped out of the race. But I still think he was up plus five, plus six. But let's just say we go with the other polls. He went down to three and he was there. All these other polls that came out that were showing Harris plus four, plus five, plus six, even, down by one, up by one. I just think those are all push polls for money and for movement. Make some money and move the narrative in the direction that they wanted. So again, my political assumption was, I think he's up plus three, probably more, but let's go with plus three. And instead of even taking the lower number of where he underperforms at plus four, I said, I want to be as conservative as possible. Let me go ahead and say that he's only going to overperform the polls, not by four or not as high as eight or anyone between, let's say only overperforms by two points. That gets me to nationwide national poll five where he's going to win the national vote i think by 1.2 million votes sort of my calculation well if that's the case then folks that's how i get to 345 because that puts new mexico into play where i think he's going to win new mexico by one to three same thing in nevada i wouldn't be surprised if he wins it in the upper you know four to five but right now you know one to three Minnesota, he's going to win if he's up plus five nationally. The trend is just going to sweep throughout there. That's going to vote. Same thing with Wisconsin. Wouldn't be surprised if a plus five victory over there. But I'll take, you know, three to five in Wisconsin. I'll take one to three in Michigan. Pennsylvania, I think he's going to win over five. I think he's going to one to three in Virginia. He's going to win New Hampshire between one to three points. And Nebraska second district. So, yes, I put myself out there. Many people are doing like 302, 312. I was one of the very few in 2016. It was one of my original Facebook posts that I did prior to the election. I thought he was going to get 322 electoral votes. I was one of the very few people that I know of. There were so many of these expert pundits that were out there at the time saying that this was going to be a landslide for Hillary. But I didn't think so. I looked at the data. I looked at some of the early voting, looked at what was happening in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, didn't believe those polls said that they were going to flip for Trump. 
and they did, and also the fact that you had a third-party candidate, Jill Stein, in there that siphoned away votes, and nobody's even talking about folks right now. It, I mean, people are talking about it, but not that much on the mainstream media, just like little blips that come here and there. You'll see that on MSNBC or MSDNC, MSLSD, whatever you want to call them, or never been conservative NBC, or, you know, the uh, Cabal Network, <laughs> Cabal News Network, CNN. But what I'm basically saying that is the Arab American vote, the Muslim vote, you got nearly 200,000 votes of that in Michigan. You got tens of thousands of those kind of votes in Pennsylvania, also in Georgia. They're not voting Harris. They're either voting Jill Stein because she's back on the ticket, or they're going with Cornell West, or they're going with Chase Oliver, or many of them are just going to stay home because they don't want to basically say we're not voting for genocide with Killer Kamala or Genocide Joe. So that's where I have, um, you know, talk about, I think, I think I mentioned Virginia, North Carolina. I didn't think that was ever a doubt. I think that's solidly in the red column, as is Georgia. And if you take a look at the early voting and the mail-in ballots, they're looking very, very good, especially, like I said, in Nevada, Florida, North Carolina. The early voting is looking extremely, extremely well. So that's, you have it in a nutshell. I haven't changed anything. I'm even more bullish than I was even before, if that can be. You know, I don't know how more you can get than more, but I'm even more, you know, uh, confident. And that's assuming, obviously assuming, that there's no rigging, there's no extra ballots that are being flown in or done, those kind of things. That's the only thing that I fear, folks. That's the only thing that I fear. We have to make this, like they say, too big to rig. Now, let's take a look and see what's happening in the last few hours as to what's happening in the political sphere as far as news from either campaigns or what's going on in the early vote or the mail-in ballots as they are coming more and more. We get more and more assessments as more and more numbers come in. Let's take a look at those right now. So bottom line, folks, if you're a Pennsylvania GOP, you're happy with what you see, but it has to keep up. GOP is performing better amongst the lowest propensity voters in Pennsylvania in the, in the mail going to continue to watch the trend. believe that, that Pennsylvania Democrats underperforming low propensity voters versus Republicans. And now here's something. There's Tom Bevan is saying that a campaign ending Trump story could end up in the New York Times next week. He said they've, he's been pitched the same story. Does not seem remotely credible, but don't be surprised if you see something in New York Times next week. Of course they're going to try that, folks. They've tried to hit him with everything out there. And nothing has stuck. If anything, it's going to galvanize people and piss them off even more about some bullshit story that's just absolutely, you know, these people are vile, they're disgusting. The New York Times, it's really the New York crimes, folks. They should all be put in jail for journalistic malpractice. Take a look at this here. Uh, this was from Change Polls, but the last thing they had Harris plus five. Now they've got it tied. I've never really heard of Change Polls. So here's a prediction. 312 to 226, 13 days out. Eric, I think this is what he's thinking. And I'm only, what, 33 ahead of him at 345. Would I care if it was 312 and Eric was right on the money? Hell no. It's like I told you before, folks, 270 to win. That's all we need. But it would be especially nice to have an electoral landslide as well as a national popular victory, too. Too big to rig. So here's what's going on in a nutshell. All right, you see lagging Democratic enthusiasm and turnout, high Republican enthusiasm and turnout. There is a rural surge. There is a lagging black turnout. 
and it happens to be a more white electorate. And these are the states where Eric says that he can confidently say that he's seen this in. This guy's not some hack, folks. He's with the Florida News Station. He's been doing this a long time. He, along with Seth Keschel, and as I said, the other people with the polling, but these guys are looking at the numbers that are coming in. And I trust these guys because they've been out there. Seth Keschel is absolutely amazing. John Walson, who's been with Nevada for decades out there, knows that state inside and out, folks. Been covering it since, you know, you know, Reed and his cronies, you know, governed, you know, Nevada like the mafia or whatever. So he's saying the states that he's seen this occurring in, the lagging Democratic enthusiasm, high Republican enthusiasm, lagging black turnout, more white electorate. I mean, what can you say? Of course, Wisconsin, Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada, Florida, Virginia. Watch this here. Flip watch. Hillsborough County, Florida is now about to flip red in the total early plus mail-in vote. It's D.6 for now. But in 2020 early voting, it was eight. It's down by seven points. And voting in the county right now, it is R plus 17, folks. 17. Hillsborough is one of the few presidential bellwethers remain true for 2020. After Hillsborough, all you got to do, flip Miami-Dade. <laughs> now look at this here. It said, ignore the Quinnipiac polls. Quinnipiac went from Trump plus four to Harris plus three in Michigan two weeks. There's no real seven point shift in the race. We simply went from an R plus one sample to a D plus four, one by party ID, and that literally explains the entire shift. He says, folks, when this guy's calling out a left-wing pollster for cooking the sample, that's when you know. Look at this here. The black vote in Georgia is below 21%. We're talking here, folks. This is just in the hours of today, October 23rd. The black vote in Georgia is below 21%. White vote is at 63%. Nate Silver, slowly and slowly, you know, coming back around to saying what? Rain's hard to know what to expect other than the fact that this is a really close race. Wow. That's just powerful, powerful, I mean, analysis. He gets paid hundreds of millions of dollars to say something like that. Amazing, folks. Amazing. It's like, you know, cut me a check for $100 million. I'll tell you how this penny lands. Flip the penny. I think about, it's going to be really close over 100 times. And it's probably going to be around 50-50. Sometimes it might be, you know, 53-47. So every once in a while, it might be 55-45. But overall, it'll mostly be 50-50. That's my analysis of coin flipping. That's what these guys are like. That's what all of them are like. You know, you see the same thing, folks. See the same thing. Harry Enten comes up. Aggregator for CNN. Put some stuff up there. Lately, he's been putting that stuff that the non-college white vote. Trump is losing that to Kamala Harris. Or the, he's been losing it since 2016 by two to three points. From Clinton, down two or three points against Biden, down two or three or four points with Harris. But in the swing states, he's up plus one. So, you know, you see that. And then other places you see where they're, Harris is losing the black vote, losing the Muslim vote, losing the Hispanic vote, losing the Latino vote. So these guys are like schizophrenic. They're like all over the place. <laughs> So he's going on here. You can win the argument. You can have better policies. You can have the record. You can be right. But if and when Trump wins, and this is so true, folks, 
the GOP embraced early voting because Donald Trump realized, I believe, that that was a big mistake. And it was only a 40,000 point mistake, folks, 40,000 vote mistake of early voting. We overcame some huge firewalls, 1.4 million votes in Pennsylvania to lose only by what, 60 or 70,000 when you had a 1.4 million advantage. But the early vote campaign, early voter registration campaigns, the ones that Scott Pressler is doing, Cliff Maloney in Pennsylvania, Turning Point USA, um, the pack from Elon Musk, you know, just going out there, knocking on doors, making voter registration, registering the Amish to vote, and then getting them out to vote. When you piss off the Amish folks, when you've gone that far that you are causing the Amish to vote in Pennsylvania, man, you've really done something bad if you're pissing off the Amish people, because it takes a lot to get those guys upset. I mean, it really, really does. Here's what we were talking about. Today, the Quinnipiac polls, the push polls, movement, money, yeah, that, that drive the narrative. The sample shift size shifted five points in two weeks, really? It went from Harris plus three, where last poll, Trump was plus three, so that's a six-point move, literally? The sample in the Trump plus three was R plus one? Well, what do you expect when you get a sample D plus four? That's un. Unbelievable. Kamala Harris says she's going to deliver a closing argument speech next Tuesday at the National Mall. Nice. She wants to contrast herself between the former president, Donald Trump, and herself. Unbelievable. Oh, and this is what happens when you have nothing more to talk about. Yep. Talk about somebody being unhinged, unstable. Lying that he talked about Adolf Hitler, saying that those who tried to stop Trump from pursuing his worst impulses like Hitler, like John Kelly, will no longer be in the White House to rein him in. Trump wants unchecked power. This is our Kumala Harris. This is where they go to, folks. This is where they go to. And this is the statement, and this is exactly what you need. Trump campaign statement on Kamala Harris lying and losing. Kamala Harris is a stone-cold loser who is increasingly desperate because she is flailing and her campaign is in shambles. This is why she continues to peddle outright lies and falsehoods that are easily disproven. The fact is that Kamala's dangerous rhetoric is directly to blame for the multiple assassination attempts against President Trump, and she continues to stoke the flames of violence all in the name of politics. She is despicable and her grotesque behavior proves she is wholly unfit for office from the Trump campaign communications director. That's what's going on, folks, out there. And you can just see it's just more polls from Quinnipiac, Harris and Trump tied. Quinnipiac, Harris up in Michigan, plus three. I mean, this is just ridiculous, just ridiculous. Here's an ad, folks, that I think is just... Trump's making it here. Let's take a look at this ad. I have a little problem. We're a failing nation. We do it. Why? I just. Looks like we're having a slight little technical problem here. Ask one simple question. Why didn't she do it? Why hasn't she done it? She's been there for three and a half years. They've had three and a half years to fix the border. They've had three and a half years to create jobs and all the things we talked about. Why hasn't she done it? Because you believe in things that the American people don't believe in. You believe in things like we're not going to frack. We're not going to take fossil fuel. Did you ban offshore drilling? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question I'm in favor of banning frack. Things that are going to make this country strong, whether you like it or not. We're a failing nation. We're a nation that's in serious decline. We're being laughed at all over the world. The worst vice president in the history of our country. There's 
that uh, let's see if there's anything else that's going on here oh here's something folks miami-dade county the early vote is now r 16.1 and take a look at this history has it no gop presidential candidate in modern history has lost the presidency if they won miami-dade and there it is miami-dade county up 16.1 folks red miami dade which has been a stronghold for the democrats in terms of their voting demographic there that is hugely in black and latino and hispanic and miami dade at least right now is flipping for the republicans at 16 points that's just absolutely incredible absolutely incredible no oh, here's that thing we're talking about 2020 biden led the group of voters by five points so biden in 2020 was leading independence in michigan pa and wisconsin by five trump's winning them by one trump's winning them by one but yet he's in trouble i don't understand that harry i really don't I really don't. Anyways, folks, we appreciate you taking the time to watch. You've been watching the Dr. Nasser Shakes. I've been your host. My name is Dr. Nasser. If you've done so already, subscribe to the channel, like, share, and follow. So you all know what to do. Take a look at our video links above and below. My final thought is always, when you're right, you're right. And when you're left, you're wrong. Until next time, folks, take care and stay safe.